So, could you tell us who, who you are? Okay. I'm, I'm Jill Tarter. I currently hold the Bernard M. Oliver Chair for SETI at the SETI Institute in Mountain View, California. Oh, and uh, how did you get into this? How did you, you were a little girl and looked up at the sky and said, I wonder if there is, is there anybody out there like Jodie Foster's character did? Well, not quite. I'd walk, um, when I was a small child, I'd go with my parents to visit my aunt and uncle in the Keys of West Florida, uh, the west coast of Florida. Very, very dark. Nobody lived there except my beachcomber aunt and uncle. And my dad and I would walk along the beach at night and I'd look up and, and I remember having this feeling that probably on some of those stars up there, there'd be another creature walking along an ocean coast with their parent looking at our sun as one of the stars in their sky. and you know, wondering about us. So no big aha moment, it just uh, out on the dark beaches in uh, an uninhabited key in Florida, it seemed like there could in fact be other places in the universe that would uh, host intelligent life. So you think there's something about being alone, really alone on Earth, at least far from all the other human beings that makes you think about being alone in the universe? Well, at least it gives you some time and space to be undistracted, uh, to actually concentrate and think and, and you know, appreciate the awesome sky up there. And so uh, are we alone? I don't know the answer to that question. We could be alone or we could be one of many different uh, separately evolved, independently evolved civilizations and technologists. But the only way we're going to find out is by trying to find out. Uh, we've spent millennia asking the priests and the philosophers and other people we thought were wise what we should believe, right? So we'd get back an answer that was dependent on somebody's or some institution's belief systems. And I think now, since the middle of the 20th century, when we've begun to have some tools, radio telescopes, that we could use to uh, do the experiment, to make the observations, to try and find out what is, rather than believing what someone tells us is, that it's a much better approach. Let's go find out what's there. Now, now Seth Shostak and I, and you as well, I've made the point that our technology is improving so rapidly that we're exploring more and more parameters space and very quickly. Do you think that's a, a based on that, can you say, oh, we're gonna, I mean, Seth has been very optimistic about this and say, we're increasing so quickly in our technological abilities that we will soon contact them. Well, we can certainly calculate how long it will take us to do search X, search Y, search Z, uh, of a certain number of stars, of a certain number of different modulation schemes, et cetera, et cetera. So we can tell you how long it's going to take to search a significant amount of um, our local universe. But that can't tell you at all whether that will succeed, whether that's enough. Because in fact, we're so young technologically that perhaps we don't even understand, have not yet invented the appropriate technology with which to, to make the search. And so you use what you have, you do the best job that you can, but you also put some effort in trying to stay around long enough as a technological society to uh, eventually invent the appropriate, the right technology that will allow you to succeed if success is possible. I think it was in the early 60s when Lovelock was hired by NASA to try to find out any way to detect life on Mars, and he came up with this way of, hey, we, there is no life on Mars because we, can, we don't need to go there, and that was the wrong, that was the answer that they didn't want to hear. Something similar is with the Fermi paradox. He said, hey, they haven't been here, therefore, they would have, if they existed, they would have already been here, therefore they don't exist. Or do you have any favorite solutions to that Fermi paradox? Yeah, I actually don't think the Fermi paradox is a true philosophical paradox because um, it requires you being able to say, but they're not here, and therefore they can never have been anywhere, any when, et cetera. I don't think we can say they're not here. I'm not persuaded uh, by the stories of uh, Aunt Alice being abducted off the streets of a major city for medical experiments on board a spacecraft. I, I don't believe in any of that at all because there's never been any evidence 
to the reality of those claims. But in fact, we've so poorly explored our own region of the solar system that a Coke can sized object filled with really clever uh, artificial intelligence would totally be overlooked. I mean, we're having a hard time finding rocks coming our direction that are 140 meters in diameter. Smaller dark things, we can't rule out. We've looked a few places. We've looked at the Lagrange points. We've looked uh, for reflected light off objects. We've done a little bit of radar scanning. But uh, while we might have stumbled across a battleship Galactica, this uh, small little probe will certainly be a, have been overlooked to date by our searches. So I don't think we can say they're not here. If you say they're not here, you've got some model about big wet biology boldly going across the galaxy. That might not be the right model. They, they, their intelligent agents, their um, robotic presence could well be here. What about, what about, you mentioned Coke cans. What about smaller dust particles or even nano aliens? <laughs> that could be correct. We haven't found any evidence of those. But if that's the way uh, other technological civilizations explore the, uh, the galaxy, then uh, yes, we would certainly have overlooked those. So you don't know of any microscopists who have been looking for aliens? I certainly know of microscopists who have claimed to see evidence of aliens. I don't find that evidence very compelling. Do you? You must have looked at it. <laughs> I, I think they've got the Nobel Prizes for yeah, some of their discoveries. Yeah, big Nobel Prizes for sure. <laughs> All right. Oh, I just realized I have my own little robot uh, on. Excuse uh, me. <laughs> let's, let's get uh, back to reality. Okay. Uh, you mentioned at the conference, previous conference we were at, uh, Carl Schroeder, and about how, could you tell us about his, I, the quote from Martha C. Clarke was, you know, any sufficiently advanced intelligence will be uh, indistinguishable from magic. Magic, yeah. And then, but Carl Schroeder had this modification saying any sufficiently distinguished, distinguished sufficiently advanced technology will be indistinguishable from nature. Nature. So can you talk about that for a bit? Well, it, it's an interesting thought, right? How can you manage to become an old technology? Uh, I think inevitably, even if you are a machine technology, I think you're going to end up having to um, husband your planet, your energy resources, and your population. And in doing so, it might be that uh, the, the footprint that you end up uh, leaving on your planet that can be remotely sensed is very minuscule. That, in fact, an old technology is one that does not hugely, massively modify its environment, but in fact allows the environment to be as close to natural as possible because it is those kinds of systems that we have thus far experienced in our universe which have longevity. The, uh, the modified systems that we've been creating, in fact, are quite short-lived on a cosmic timescale. How about, now you've been looking for aliens or signals from extraterrestrial intelligence for quite a long time. Have there any been some, been some false alarms where you were just excited, oh, we've got one this time. What was the most excited you've ever been? Yeah, we've had a few of what have turned out to be false positives, but in the moment were, um, you know, adrenaline rushing kind of events. Do stupid things, uh, and with each one, we learn how to do the job better uh, as far as what we need to do to check that what we have found is what we think it might be as opposed to some form of our own technology which is fooling us. And to date, that's what we found. We found ourselves a number of times without realizing it for a while. What was the most convincing one? The most convincing one was a signal coming from the SOHO spacecraft, which was, it's in orbit around the sun, just as the Earth is in orbit around uh, the sun. And 
We had a protocol when we were doing um, the, the Phoenix project that used two widely separated telescopes and turned them into a pseudo-interferometer to help us discriminate against our own technologies. Well, on this one occasion, the remote telescope in Georgia had been hit by lightning and fried a disk drive. So for a few days, we were down to our primary telescope, which was the 140 foot at Green Bank, West Virginia. And with that single telescope, the best thing we could do to discriminate against uh, technologies that were getting into our system by scattering off the superstructure uh, was to look at a target and then look away from the target and then go back on the target and look away again without our interferometer to allow us to, uh, to check um, for differential Doppler motion of a distant target uh, as seen by two widely spaced telescopes. We were just left with this on and off. And the Green Bank Telescope, because of the way um, the structures around it, had a tiny little side lobe, uh, a place where the telescope had extra sensitivity that was exactly 90 degrees away from the direction we thought we were pointing the telescope. And that's where the SOHO spacecraft would end up every time we looked at our target and tracked it across the sky. When we looked in some other direction, that side lobe went somewhere else and SOHO fell out of it. But when we came back to our target, there it was again. And so we went on for the better part of a day until this source we were tracking set, uh, convinced that we really had something interesting. And then it set and we went off to dinner at Green Bank. Um, unfortunately, we forgot to call our Cal California colleagues and tell them uh, we were pretty convinced that uh, this wasn't it. And so they stayed up all night waiting for the source to rise again the next morning while we slept in because we'd figured it out <laughs> overnight. <laughs> Did you break out the champagne? Or? We didn't. We, we broke out the crying towels, right? It was disappointing oh, that, this had not, that this had, in fact, not turned out to, uh, to be what we had hoped it would be. You yeah. were crying. Wow. Oh, it was disappointing. Oh. I mean, just as we were exhilarated right, as right, we were right. trying to, to do the detection. And as I said, when you get this excited, you do silly things. You make mistakes. So I did something relatively clever for me. There was a particular uh, signature in the signal that we detected. It was like a picket fence, and there was a constant spacing between each of the, uh, the frequency artifacts. And I thought, well, let me just write a program and look for that frequency spacing uh, in any of the data we've taken here in the last two weeks, right? Maybe we've seen this when looking at some other direction, which would tell me that, no, it, it actually has nothing to do with the star that we were tracking. And I did that, and it, it actually compiled and it ran, but I didn't do it very elegantly, and so my printout was a little unrectified and hard to read, and indeed I missed the fact that we had seen exactly that frequency spacing uh, a couple of times before from some other direction. And had I read my, my results correctly, we could have shortchanged all of the hours <laughs> of excitement. But so I was you, too excited. So I didn't. We detected SOHO. We detected SOHO, and it fooled us for a long and time. And there are other things that you said we detect ourselves, so that would be one well, example. Well, that's, that's one example of our technology that we found. We uh, detected a Paris. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, not in Paris, but in the outskirts of Paris, we detected uh, a, an airport when using the Nancy telescope. Now, a couple of weeks ago, Yuri Milner decided to support uh, SETI efforts for $100 million over the next right. 10 years. And do you think that infusion of money will A, help SETI searches, and B, help them avoid things like you just described? Oh, how can it not help? It's fantastic. <laughs> It's a big chunk of change and at least a 10-year period of uh, commitment to continue doing the search. So that will help. And as people deal with more and more data, because our technology and Moore's law allows us to swallow more of the data that we'd like to, uh, to analyze more quickly, 
they're going to have to deal with all kinds of different potentials for interference. And so, yeah, they'll get cleverer. I mean, when you have mother necessity, right, mother of invention, when there's something driving you that's, that's interrupting and interfering with the work you want to do, you figure out how to take care of it. So we'll learn and we'll develop, no doubt, uh, the SETI community will develop a lot of uh, better, more sophisticated tools. And maybe, maybe this 10 years is what we've been needing. Um, $100 million is great. We could use more. We could use more Uri Milner's, and I'm really hoping that his very public uh, announcement of support for this endeavor and that exquisitely eloquent open letter that he published about the fact that this is something that humanity should be doing. I hope that'll inspire others to join him and bring more funds. And ultimately, probably what's needed is, is to build an endowment. So 10 years of stability, that's great, but this might take 100 years or longer. I think we need to be like our, our universities, to have a, a fund that's invested and the interest can pay for the cutting edge research year after year. Now at that launch in London, Hawking uh, had a very elegant statement and then, but they also talked about Hawking's, uh, he's, well, he's a member of a significant minority, I think, that are afraid of contact. And so this, this breakthrough message is to create a message, but they promise not to send the message. And the idea is, oh, we should keep our heads down. Are you, uh, are you like that? Do you share those fears? Um, you know, Stephen is obviously brilliant. He has an enormous intellect and knowledge about many things, but he doesn't know anything about alien psychology. <laughs> uh, as he said, but he does know a lot about human psychology. And I think the aliens that uh, we might have cause to be worried about um, those that could get here, for example, and pose a physical threat, they're, by definition, a lot more advanced than we are. I find it hard to understand how a technological civilization can manage to get to be that advanced without outliving uh, these aggressive tendencies that were part and parcel of us becoming an intelligent species. I think we have to outgrow them. I think there's some indication, Steven Pinker's work, for example, that we are doing a better job at that and that it may be the advanced older technologies that are precisely those we don't have to fear rather than you know, the more aggressive younger sons of bitches that we are. So I don't know. Steven's bright, but I don't think he knows any more about this than I do. And let's face it, if that's the scenario, if an advanced technology were to show up on our doorstep, um, they'd make the rules. <laughs> um, at this launch, Yuri Milner quoted you as saying, if you go down to the ocean and fill up a bucket with water and you don't find a fish, that doesn't mean there aren't any fish in the ocean. Did you really say that? Or? Yeah, I actually really did with some help from some PBS producers. <laughs> right. Um, it's true. It's an experiment that could work, right? There are lots of fish that are appropriate in size, that they could fit inside of a glass of water. And if you scooped up a glass out of the ocean, there's a probability, statistical probability, that you'd catch a fish. But that probability is so small, given the experiment and the size of the ocean, um, that you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't be discouraged or draw a very substantial conclusion. There are no fish in the ocean from that one experiment. If you looked very carefully at the water, though, you would find billions of bacteria, not uh, more specifically viruses. So microbes would be there, and so you would have found the life, at least some indication of life that's in the, in the ocean. That's correct, but that wasn't my experiment. <laughs> my experiment is to go looking for a fish, yeah. and the only tools I say I have available to myself are a glass and my eye, my eyesight. Mm -hmm. So uh, 
smallest fish is about a millimeter in size, could certainly see that with the naked eye if I happen to catch one. Doesn't tell me anything about viruses uh, or microorganisms that might, in fact, we know would be teeming in that glass. Um, other tools are, are necessary. But I can't draw a conclusion about fish <laughs> from that experiment. Now you must be uh, the recipient of many emails from crackpots and very sane people who have seen UFOs and been abducted. And how do you deal with that? I say, show me the evidence, right? I actually belong, um, it used to be called the Committee for the Study of Paranormal, of the Paranormal, it's now CSI, right? Mm -hmm. um, the Committee for Scientific Inquiry. Uh, I'm one of those people who are willing to look at data and evidence that are submitted. And I look at a, I look at a whole lot of stuff. <laughs> and to date, there hasn't been anything that has stood up to, well, my goodness, that has to be an extraterrestrial spacecraft. That has to be alien technology. You know, I've actually seen a UFO. It's, it's a very, um, very illuminating experience. My husband and I were flying our small airplane back to the Bay Area one night, and we were high enough so that we were under positive control. But nevertheless, suddenly we saw this bright light at 2 o'clock. Bright light. And it, to us, it looked like the headlight of an oncoming airplane, airplane. But the controller on the ground hadn't told us about any traffic in our area. So we get on the, we get on the radio and we say, what do you show at our 2 o'clock position? And well, there's nothing on my radar at your two o'clock position, you know? And my husband looks at me and I look at him and we're really you know, two of the real most hard-nosed skeptical people, but we are, you know, we're enforcing the fact that we're both seeing a bright light. Mm -hmm. And it looks like it's coming right towards us. And yet our radar doesn't see it. Well, it went on for a very awkwardly long few moments until clouds that I guess we hadn't realized were there parted a little bit more and enlarged the hole through which the moon was shining at us. And we were able to resolve our unidentified object as being the moon. So it was no longer unidentified. But for a while it was, and it was real. And we're trying to understand it in terms of the worldviews that we have, the physics that we think we understand. And it was weird. It was eerie. It, it was real. We did see something. Many people see things. There's no question about that. But the, the link to alien spacecraft is what thus far remains missing. So if the clouds had not parted? Uh, we would have turned. I mean, this. Driven, you're going around and around looking for it. What is that? What is that? Well, we, we would have turned to get out of its way oh. because the, the impression was it's coming towards us. I see. And you know, as we maneuvered, we probably would have become aware of the fact that there were a lot of clouds. There aren't any other stars up there. Hmm, I wonder why that is. Well, I, we, we might have figured it out. Uh, fortunately, it got figured out for us because the clouds rearrange themselves. Were you able to talk with Carl Sagan when he was still alive about the use of the digits of pi in the novel contact and how that is or is not or could or could not be a signal from, I don't know, some omniscience, kind of like a godlike alien that created the universe or something? I'm not, have you talked to him about that or I don't understand that? Well, we actually talked about rather how um, Robert Zemeckis had changed the ending of the book. Uh, when he made the movie Contact, because of course Carl was alive while that was being filmed. He, he passed away while it was being edited at Warner Brothers. Uh, and we talked about that change. And, you know, it's, to me it's sad because Robert Zemeckis made an ending that supports um, a sequel, because he likes to do sequels. <laughs> but there hasn't ever been a contact too. Yeah, Carl and I talked about it, the ending, and it, you know, if the digits are pi, of pi are infinite, there is every possible potential pattern within them. And so Carl 
suggesting this pattern is totally reasonable. Any other pattern would also have been reasonable. But yeah, he admitted that for an audience, a movie-going audience, understanding that ending would have been a stretch in any, in any case. So it had to change, and the change was, as I said, to support a sequel. What well, was Carl's idea there that that some alien godlike creature created a signal in Pi for uh, somebody like us to read when we become the self-conscious part of the universe? Is that the idea? It that was his idea. Uh -huh. um, that whether that has a lot of credibility because, as I said, that pattern's going to be there somewhere in the digits of Pi. The implication was it just got moved up so that the factoring algorithms that Jody was running in the background on her, on her uh, machines of the day, in fact, found it, right? And didn't find it uh, 2,000 years in the future, right, when they were getting, they didn't have just a million digits or a trillion digits or, uh, you know, a finite number, but a very large number of digits they'd factored. Uh, it came up early. How about, I mean, that's a rather weird idea for an alien, but I bet you've run across quite a few weird notions about alienness or what the aliens are going to be like, what form they'll take, whether we're living inside of an alien, for example. Well, could you tell us one or two of the weirdest ideas that you're kind of fond of that you, I mean, that you don't necessarily believe in, but seem yeah. interestingly weird? Well, I get I get a lot of interesting email, and and actually, it's a little sad to think that people out there don't have anybody closer to them. To, to talk to than, than me. They send me out of the blue some ideas that they're very wedded to, and then I feel those must be pretty lonely people. But uh, the one I like best is that every electron is a sentient being. That was, a, that was an interesting thought. Um, and Every electron is a sentient, so it has parts to it that can move around and, and compute or something? Um, you have to have substructure to be a sentient being, I would imagine. <sighs> It had some self-awareness would be the implication from this one from okay. this one email. Every okay. electron. And quarks but, too or just like uh, they were very it was only the leptons, <laughs> okay. right? They were very, very selective. Um, so I actually think that we don't think widely enough about what an independently evolved form of life might be. Really? Um, we know life as we know it. We can only figure out sort of one way to do biology. When we try and pull it apart, we have a very hard time distinguishing between what's necessary and what might have been contingent. Just it happened that way for us. And then all life that we currently know is related to that first life, and it's all the same. So when, when the National Academy of Sciences in the States puts out a report on weird life, it says there's something to this. Um, thinking more broadly about life that uses um, different metabolic pathways, different uh, solvents, different structures, and if it's evolving in response to different environmental conditions than we found on the surface and the depths of the ocean in, on this planet, then it could be very different. And I think it's intriguing uh, to think about the potential that there is weird life. There is another, there is biology 2.0 on this planet, but we haven't found it because all the tools that we've developed to look for life, to look for biology, are based on life as we know it. So it's, um, it's not crazy. I, I, the, there are many things in a bureaucracy that, that get created and written about, and you know, she shouldn't take them all at face value. But I'm, I'm very impressed when the National Academy can hold a series of workshops and they try to talk themselves out of this idea and end up just elaborating on more and more possibilities. So 
we probably, this is one of those unknown unknowns, and we don't know as much as we think we do. Now, I, I've written uh, about what I've called the fallacy of the, uh, the planet of the apes, the fallacy of the planet of the apes, and uh, about the non-convergence of biology on Earth onto human-like intelligence. Now, you are not completely convinced or not convinced at all about this. Could you tell us a little bit about why, why you disagree with some of the things that I've been writing? Well, what I was disagreeing with you is your, um, your statement that there's no there are no examples of convergent evolution in, in life as we know it. And, and I think that that is incorrect. I mean, you are arguing that there were elaborations in different body plans and different architectures based on a pre-existing sensitivity, right? But I think that's actually um, not a negative of convergent evolution. I think that, uh, to me, convergent evolution is having uh, having a challenge, a need in a physical environment, and finding multiple ways to meet that challenge. And so I think the camera eye is a good example of convergent evolution, even if you say, well, we trace that all the way back to the photosensitive uh, capabilities in some very distant ancestor. And so that was there and it wasn't really an independent solution of the camera eye. Everybody just uh, you know, played off the same thing. But I think that's, that's not the way it happened. I think to say they played off the same thing means there was some kind of different plans, but I just think that what we're seeing is that indeed evolutionary, incremental evolutionary changes made for totally different reasons, and being different choices to begin with, then in elaboration came up with eyes that see in optical light. Not to mention the eyes that see at UV and other wavelengths, but, and I think that's a fair definition of convergent evolution. And so if it can happen here, um, and you find yourself in an environment that is illuminated uh, by an optical spectrum that peaks in the green, there will probably be a lot of elaborations on some other uh, photosensitive cells somewhere else that end up producing eyes that can see and maybe minds that can think. I think in 1994, 1995, I think Carl Sagan and Ernst Meyer had a discussion of bait going back and forth about the idea of whether human-like intelligence is a convergent feature of evolution. And Carl's, I think, came up, I'm not sure if he came up with it then, but he would repeat functionally equivalent homo sapiens and uh, Ernst Meyer. And, and in fact, most biologists that I talk to are not as confident as physicists seem to be that human-like intelligence is a convergent feature of evolution, that intelligence is, a, is necessarily a useful thing. We all go around saying, you know, two kangaroos, one's smart and one's not so smart. The smart one will leave more offspring because it figured out how to do X, Y, and Z. But Ernst Meyer, the biologist, and many biologists, George K. Edward Simpson, uh, they think that uh, no human-like intelligence is a species-specific thing, and therefore we should not expect it anywhere else on Earth, and let alone elsewhere in the universe and that our closest relatives are here on Earth. Uh, so how, what do you, can you talk to that? Well, I think that the one thing that I, that I agree with um, that Ernst Meyer was arguing is that we're not going to find another humanoid out there, right? It's not going to, to no look like us. Aliens, hmm? No sex with aliens. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 it depends Hollywood. on, some roommates <laughs> are a little, okay. Um, so yeah, I think that um, we shouldn't expect to meet ourselves, right? That doesn't mean that we shouldn't expect to meet intelligent tool manufacturing and using um, aliens. And so Dawkins makes, excuse me, we have a alien life here, yeah. Uh, Dawkins makes, uh, some cogent arguments about a predator-prey relationship, always ratcheting up intelligence and that driving uh, forward. Now, 
the most intelligent um, prey and predator pair versus humans. Okay, so what is the difference between human intelligence and any other intelligence? I think that maybe the difference is in how we ask the question. So when Ernst Mayer and Carl were having these debates, you know, we were pretty parochial in terms of what we thought of as intelligent. And we'd argue that, well, humans are intelligent because only they can do this. And then we'd find out, we are finding, that if we ask the questions correctly, that no, other species can do this. And so suddenly that drops out of our requirement to be human intelligence. I mean, when prairie dogs have a way of saying, here's that guy, that big guy in the red sweater again, to one another, that's pretty significant. And back in the Sagan Mayer debate days, we didn't know that that existed. We didn't know how to ask those questions. We didn't know how to, to make the studies that would illuminate that capability of information exchange and communication. So I think it's, I think part of the problem is us and how we define what it is that's human intelligence. We keep defining it to be narrower and narrower and more away from things we're learning that others can do. It reminds me of the God of the margins, but the human being of the margins. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I still don't understand. I don't think anyone understands what was behind the very large increase in human brain size right, at the end of the last glacial period. What drove that? Was it just the... Uh, the jack of all trades, the every man was the needed to survive in the changing, uh, rapidly changing climate. Is that what did it? I don't know. That's, that's an intriguing thing. We don't see such radical, large scale changes over short periods of time very often. And can you not have human like intelligence unless that's happened to your species? The uh, Dawkins argument about predator prey and the, the predator getting more intelligent, and I guess the, pre the prey getting faster or something, um, there have been probably thousands and thousands of examples of that, but none has led to, uh, I guess, human like intelligence. So, would that be a counterexample to his argument? or? No, it hasn't led to human like intelligence yet. It's <laughs> gone. It's gone as far as it needs to. Okay. Right? To date. Now, the next. It doesn't say that it's at an end. Each of those predator-prey uh, pairs is continuing in this process. And they've been going on for, I don't know, maybe 100 million years or so, and that's a long time to go on, and the increase of our brain was like two or three million years. So. Mm -hmm. Anyway, let me ask you about Jane Goodall. Have you talked to her about SETI at all? I haven't actually mm -hmm. had that pleasure, no. Okay. <laughs> all right, good. And, um, how about, you know, this, is, this MOOC is for students and they're not astronomers and so they're not used to thinking about the universe and they're often not biologists either. So, so can you give us some advice about how these students should uh, grapple with this idea about connecting the scientific idea of Genesis, how we got here, with this idea of are we alone? Yeah. Boy, your students have, have an exciting future ahead of them, right? Their lives are going to be so unlike ours, their professional lives, they're going to change what they do probably a lot more frequently than we've changed how we live our professional lives, right? The technology around them is going to change. The world's going to change. Um, they're going to have to be a lot more flexible than we have had to be. Uh, I think they'll have a lot more fun. Uh, I think they'll, um, by virtue of this different kind of maturation process and being willing and being cognizant of the fact that they must change in the future as things change around them, they may be able to structure outcomes, uh, long-term outcomes, better than, than we've been able to. So I like to think about SETI as one of those topics 
that thinking about it, talking about it, doing it in any way causes you to shift your point of view, change your perspective a little bit, at least away from the what am I going to have for lunch and dinner and where am I going to go to bed tonight? Um, it causes you to step back a little and to ask the kinds of questions that you're trying to pose in this course. Where did I come from? How do I fit in? Are there others? Am I unique? Are humans unique? Or are we one of many? And as you take that step backwards, Sometimes we talk about the view from 3,000 feet or 30,000 feet. Um, you're forced to entertain the notion that for anyone out there looking at us, we're all the same, right? So this discipline, this, this uh, exploration, scientific exploration, has the uh, potential to encourage you to have this point of view that humans are all the same, to trivialize the differences among us that we find so difficult. And if you can adopt that I'm an earthling kind of outlook, then you actually are better prepared to, to struggle with these other challenges we have all around us challenges that don't reflect national boundaries. I and mean, we've got to get our population under control. We've got to manage our planet if we're to have a long future. And I think that individuals who have been conditioned to think of themselves as earthlings have a better chance of working together cooperatively to solve those challenges than people who look at themselves and say, well, my skin is two shades lighter than yours, therefore we've got nothing in common. And so I think SETI as a big picture topic is an ideal one for tackling all kinds of questions and solving all kinds of challenges. Now we're doing this interview in Hawaii and about 250 years ago, Captain Cook, uh, appeared on the shores of Kauai as an alien and uh, I guess they were, I guess there was some contact and they were friendly but that didn't end well for the Hawaiians because their population was decimated uh, from disease and from exploitation. Uh, so that's the kind of thing that Stephen Hawking is afraid of and many people are afraid of. With the, and you, just to reiterate, you think that aliens, if they've lived long enough to be detectable or to get here, will have overcome their imperialistic tendencies that, that Cook was harboring inside of his British mentality? I think that, uh, yeah. I think if you're going to grow to be an old technology, you have to outgrow a lot of the things that helped you to become intelligent in the first place. And among other things, Charlie, I just think we've got to outgrow organized religion <laughs> because it's not going to help in the future. Andrew and came down on organized religion. I think to some extent Carl did in his book. He talked about, uh, the, I guess, traditional baggage, I think, is what the, mm -hmm. the word she used. Uh, you know, uh, let's see. Let's ask the question again. Are we alone? The answer is the same as when we started this interview. I don't know the answer to the are we alone question. I find it one of the most important questions to try and find an answer too. And I think the best way to find the answer is to look. And if we find that there's no one out there, do you think that's a waste of space? Mm -hmm. If we find that there's no one out there, I think the message is that we ought to be taking even better care of the life that we do have on, on this planet that we do know about. Um, but, you know, that's a really very significant conclusion that there's no life out there. Um, you don't make that on the basis of 10 years of searching, or 50 years of searching. You don't make that lightly. So you don't make or draw that conclusion until the amount of effort that you've put into the search is commensurate with the importance of that conclusion. 
but let's say in a thousand years or ten thousand years and even a million years from now we've been looking and we haven't found anything and so we've looked a lot and so we'd, we'd say oh I guess we're the only ones here would that be a waste of space would that be a waste of space I think that's too it's it's very clever line in a movie I think it's too uh, it puts too much intent onto the cosmos I think the cosmos is what it is and we fit into it somehow and it wasn't intentional. It is what it is. <laughs>